in this segment of processes and threads, we will be looking at what a typical scheduler does and the concept of Unix processes. In general, each process has at least a single thread of execution. It could have more. This we will call as heavyweight process. The reason we call, why we call it as a heavyweight process will become more apparent as we're going along the course. Essentially, trying to swap out one process with another one is significantly more expensive than trying to swap out a thread from the same process with another thread from the same process. In general, though, the data structure is the same for the both. In fact, Linux does not distinguish between threads and processes as far as its own scheduling is concerned, scheduling policies are concerned. Uh, similar to thread control block, each process also has a process control block. Uh, like I said, in Linux, both of these hold the same amount of state. And some of the states could include things like uh, what st status the process is in, maybe it's got I.O. outstanding, maybe it's waiting on some long events, and how much time it's been vended out. A CPU switch be between processes is a pretty complicated procedure, and it requires multiple elements of coordination between the software and the hardware. In this figure, I've shown you the switch from processes P0 to process P1. So we're going from this one to this one, right? So initially, process P0 is executing, and then it gets stopped at this point. And at this point, essentially, what happens is that the operating system would have set up a timer, or there might have been an I.O. event from processor 0. Either way, it immediately traps into the OS. From our previous week of classes, we know how a trap under the OS works. Essentially, uh, it's an interrupt line is triggered, and that vectors on to a handler in the operating system. The first thing that the operating system does is note on all the state that it needs in order to restart the process. Right. So when P1 finishes at some point later on, and then we're going to start P0 again, at this point, this state has to map on. So we need to know exactly how to restart, right? So first thing it does is save all the state into the process control block of PCB0. Then what it does, it does a whole bunch of other handling, bookkeeping, for example, keeping track of how long process 0 ran for, how long P1 wants to run for, keeps track of these things, and then loads up the state from that it previously had checkpointed from process, process P1. Okay. Then process P1 starts running until it lands up in an interrupt or a system call. And when that happens, you save the state again onto PCB1 and then reload the state from PCB0. In general, manipulating this, this, this whole context switch process has relatively large overhead. First thing you need to do is essentially flush, there are a whole bunch of caches scattered throughout the hardware, uh, in the hardware, which have noted on all kinds of state transparently, implicitly, when the process is running. For example, it caches the translations of where the stack is mapped, uh, so on and so forth. Um, in such, these things, an example of this is what's known as a translation lookaside buffer, which essentially caches your translation maps. Now, when another process comes and runs, it's got its own stack and heap that it wants to run with, and it shouldn't touch any of the elements of P0. So when P1 wants to run, what it needs to do is essentially flush out the translations, flush out all the caches, manipulate the page tables, and it in even involves copying memory because it has to copy this uh, PCB, which is all the registers in your processor, uh, the PC, the stack pointer, all of that, and a few other control registers back into the CPU, and that involves at least 64-odd registers, each one being 64-bit, 8 bytes. That's around... Um, 512 kilobytes of data. So sorry, 512 bytes of data, which is around half a kilobyte. Thread context switch is similar, except that you don't deal with thread control blocks as opposed to process control blocks, and some of the control state need not be copied because threads share all the states. So for example, the remapping need not be done. So if you're switching to another thread from the same um, uh, application, then in general you don't need to flush out all the caches, only some of them need to be flushed out. You still need to copy all the state 
you still need to copy all this uh, checkpoint of this registered step but you don't need to manipulate the page table for example all right so in this figure what I've shown you is a process state machine so a process state machine essentially keeps track of the different phases that a thread or a process goes through right so in this case we when the process first comes into um, I'm just going to iterate over the, all the show up all the states and then we can talk about it all right so the first time a process ever comes into existence it starts out with the new state and when the operating system admits it and says okay this process is ready to be run on the CPU it's not yet ready to run it's just admitted to be ready to run that is it gets in line into the queue and wait for the CPU to become available to it. In that case, it gets into the ready state. When any when once it starts gets into the ready state, at some point uh, another process is going to get interrupted, is going to come in, and then you're going to have a scheduler dispatch event. When a scheduler dispatch event happens, the process switches from ready to running. Okay, so now is when it, the running state is the active state, is the state in which the process has control of the CPU and it's the CPU is executing instructions that belong to this specific process. At that point, at some point, the process could either finish, exit, and get terminated, and once it does, the, once it does that, the, the process control block and all other uh, state in the operating system dedicated to this specific process is garbage claim, right? Or there could be an interrupt or a timer call and this process goes back from running to ready and then waits. It waits until the OS comes back and dispatches it again onto the CPU, right? Um, when it's running, it could possibly have I/O events. We'll get into how I/O events are handled in more detail later on in the class. But it doesn't at that point when an I/O event happens, it goes into the waiting state, right? Waiting means the process is waiting for the I/O event to complete. Normally, when this happens, the OS immediately takes uh, puts it into the waiting state which is similar to the ready state, except one major difference is that when the process is in the waiting state, then it's not in line um, to get it, get time on the CPU because it's still waiting on some I.O. event, right? So even if you give it the CPU, it's not going to be useful. It's not going to be, it's not going to make use of the time on the CPU. So what the OS does is wait for the process to become ready. So when an I.O. event or completion comes, then the process transitions from waiting to ready and then at that point, it's, it gets back in queue again uh, for time on the CPU. All right. So the main, um, a lot of this is pretty standardized. So when you talk about things like switching out threads, uh, one of the important questions that comes into mind is if you have a whole bunch of processes to choose from, which one do you pick? So a ready queue is is a queue, right? So you got to pick some process from this queue to run next on the CPU. So the question is, uh, how do you actually pick the right process? Based on a different uh, optimizations are possible. You may pick the one that you've not given any time to yet. You can, in an attempt to be more fair, you can always pick the one with the least amount of work remaining so that it finishes first and you can, the queue has one less entry. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other things as well. So for example, you have things like I/O requests, so you could prioritize the ones that don't have any I/O uh, in them. Uh, time slice expired. For example, this is an attempt to be more fair, where you went out a certain amount of time, and when the thread has run out of that time, it goes back into the queue and it has to wait its turn. Uh, if it's forking off a child, waiting on an interrupt, there's a whole bunch of events, and there are many scheduling algorithms possible. That's we'll look at a bunch of them in the next segment. Right? So we're going to actually look at specific scheduling algorithms and look at what trade-offs they introduce in terms of performance and deadline to completion. In general, one of the key questions is why do we have multi-threading? Why have multiple threads per process if we can just have multiple processes and make get by? So the key thing to notice here is that you may need concurrency even for a single application. And processes being very expensive, uh, one of the things we mentioned was there are heavy weight to context switch to start to constantly keep switching between the different processes 
would be quite expensive if the application was implemented with multiple processes. And communication between processes is not so not as convenient as between threads in the same process, mainly for the reasons I just uh, described earlier with the address space, where the heap uh, is shared with threads, but not uh, and with threads adopt a shared everything model, while processes adopt a shared nothing model. So if you have a shared nothing model, in order to get the two processes to talk to each other, you have to explicitly specify copy operations between each of these processes to move any state or make any state visible. And this is obviously a hard task. So what does it take to actually create a process? Right? So what we're going to do is look at specific examples. And interestingly, the Unix, the Linux, uh, Windows, or even um, Mac OS, the Op uh, the operation of creating a process is pretty standardized. There's one specific system call that you use called fork and it's pretty much uh, standardized across most systems, right? So the question is, okay, so what do you do? So first thing you've got to do is construct a new process control block, right? So when you have a new process control block, uh, what's going to happen is that You're going to start with all the register state that you may possibly need to construct for the first time. You're going to set up the page tables uh, for the address space itself, uh, which obviously is also a more expensive operation. Okay, and in comparison, the, the the process control block itself is not the most expensive part about this whole thing, because all you're going to do is all the registers are zero to start off with, apart from the program counter and stack pointer, which are pretty easy to set up. Um, you start out with no time on the CPU, so all the bookkeeping state is just all cleaned up. The main cost is setting up the page tables, making sure that all the stack and all of that's mapped to the right parts of physical memory, making sure that all the instructions have been copied from the disk onto physical memory, uh, making sure that you've zero initialized all the stack and the heap. And doing all of that is the most expensive part. And typically, remember that you're not just starting from scratch. When you create a new process, you are creating it from another process. And essentially, only a process can create another process. You need, so when you ha when that happens, uh, the semantics of Unix, uh, says fork, are that the child process gets a complete copy of the parent memory and the I.O. state. Um, this used to be a very expensive process, but now it's much less expensive with this technique called uh, copy on write. So with copy on write, what happens is that initially the chair, parent and the child share everything. So this essentially goes makes use of the notion, the trick that if nothing changes in the child's world, so if the child makes no rights at all, it doesn't change any of the variables, then you don't need a whole different copy for the child and you can just look at the parent's copy, right? And as the child keeps incrementally changing different variables, you only need to copy the ones that change. And you know you can still leave the rest of the, the state unchanged. So this, for example, if you made a change to one variable in your stack, then your stack would get copied uh, while the, the heap would, right? So the heap is technically shared until the child modifies it. Once the child modifies it, the heap is copied as well. So essentially, you kind of incrementally bear the cost, right? So if you have a, if you fork up a child to do very little work and you don't really write out much, then it's going to be quite inexpensive. But if you have a child that immediately starts touching all the memory variables, then it's going to be expensive because incrementally the whole every word needs to be copied. Okay, it also needs to copy all the I/O state file handles, things like that. So if you have open files, then those file descriptors should be available for the child process also. So when you have multiple processes collaborating on a task. Uh, you have high creation and memory overhead. You have, as we discussed earlier, high, relatively high context switch overhead because the page tables need to be cleaned out. You need a communication mechanism between the two processes um, because you have separate address space that isolates the process. And you could have, uh, this is achieved using shared memory mapping with essentially two different parts of uh, the same um, segment in two different processes are mapped to the same physical location. So you logically there are two separate locations as far as the processes are concerned, but physically there's only one location. And you achieve it using the translation maps we discussed earlier. 
um, and then you read and write through memory. And you could achieve it using message passing, where individually you think the two processes for all practical purpose could be done on two different machines. You send and receive and explicitly copy uh, data from one process to another. This is why making multiple processes collaborate on a task is a really hard uh, thing because one you have to either explicitly declare these shared memory mappings right so it, it's it's not shared everything so for everything that you want to share uh, for anything that you want to share share you got to explicitly specify uh, that it's a shared region and the two processes have it mapped you got to map it into the uh, regions you can't share anything less than a page and so you got you can only support course grain sharing there's a whole bunch of limitations and if you message pass essentially you need expensive uh, send and receive operations which not you know even if they, they are normally first of all going to traverse the network stack and even if they don't you need to you know figure out ways to explicitly copy this data from one state to another instead of just exposing it to the other process so when you have shared memory communication, here's an example of this. So you have two shared regions. So notice that the core, data, heap, and stack are all separate. In a conventional thread, the heap would also be shared, but not in this case. You have two separate translation maps, two separate virtual address spaces. What happens is that you have one copy of the physical address frame. So you only create one copy. So this is um, the actual physical memory, right? and this is virtual address space. So what happens is that you have only one copy, both the processes point to the same copy of physical memory, right? So both these point to the same region, um, and you just, this is achieved essentially by manipulating the page translation maps. And while once set up, this can be a pretty uh, cheap way to have data move from one process to the other, it is expensive to set up the first time, okay? And it's also expensive to manipulate. Furthermore, if you want anything to share from the heap to this heap, then you gotta do one step copy here, and then another step copy from here to here, right? So if you wanna get things from one heap to another heap, and that can get expensive as well. And if you have message-based inter-process communication, the previous one we looked at was shared memory. If you had message-based ones, then essentially the two processes do not assume shared memory and they communicate using network um, IPCs or inter-process uh, communication calls. So you send and receive them. Um, if, if you have two processes that wish to communicate, they need to establish a communication link, which involves essentially copying data um, from one uh, part of the process to another and telling the operating system that you're going to set this up So there's an initial setup cost associated with this communication link Typically, it's just a software buffer that sits in the operating system and then you extend messages via send and receive so if you were to do this there would be um, a buffer in the OS itself and then what's going to happen is that so you would have an the OS buffer and Then there would be a copy from the P0, let's say that you want to copy it too, and then another set of copies from P1. So there's going to be two sets of copies, P0 to the OS buffer, OS buffer to P1, and that's why it's expensive. In Unix terminology, a thread is sometimes called a lightweight process. Thread creation and context switches are much more efficient than process creation and context switches. Um, Inter-thread communication essentially happens transparently via shared memory and since threads are the same process they share the same address space which means on thread switches you don't necessarily need to flush out the cache, the hardware caches and translation maps and so on and so forth. This, also, this is also one of the primary reasons why the context switch is more efficient. 